Hello and welcome to the Wellness Plus podcast. I'm your host, Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Marty Whittakin. She's a board-certified clinical nutritionist, best-selling author of Natural Alternatives to Nexium and Other Acid Blockers, her latest book, The Probiotic Cure. She's also the host of nationally syndicated radio show, Healthy by Nature. Thank you so much for joining me, Marty. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. So I think by now, people are becoming increasingly aware of this concept that we have good bacteria in our gut that perform really important functions um, and that we can feed those good bacteria with probiotics. Can you maybe explain a little bit of exactly what role those different bacteria are performing in the gut and why they're so important for us to support? What role they play? Mm, how much time do we have? Uh, they <laughs> do a lot of things. And I, I think it's really progress that people now know that there are good bacteria because if you th think back and most of our recent history, it's all been about how can we kill bacteria? Bacteria are evil. Mm. We have all of these sanitizers and sterilizers and everything all about killing bacteria. And there's still a lot of that feeling around, just mm -hmm. like fat-free won't die, uh, the, oh, we must kill bacteria, that now we're just a little bit uh, schizo about it having, well, yeah, on the one hand, but then on the other hand, we want good bacteria. And I think if people realize that they're good mostly because most consumer education comes from advertising mm -hmm. and from the boxes. Right. Um, we don't learn this stuff in school. <laughs> we don't. We have six minutes with the doctor. They're not going to teach us a lot about things. So it comes down to that marketing is actually where we learn a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And what we've learned is that bacteria are good for regularity thanks to um, Activa and, and different <clears throat> products that that say if you eat them three times a day. I don't think people read that fine print, but if you eat them three times a day, it'll keep you regular, and it's because of the bacteria that are in them, and those are collectively called probiotics. It means for life, pro-life. Hmm. You contrast that with antibiotics, and you get an idea they are against life, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> they do um, so much more than we ever thought. And if, if we stopped with just keeping us regular, we would miss most of the story because they help run our brain, our appetite, our lungs, our heart, uh, every bit of our digestion, protect us from virtually every disease yeah. because these critters have maybe as much as a thousand times as much DNA instructions as our own cells. Wow. And there are, there are uh, trillions of them, thousands of different kinds, and they are all busy doing something. They are busy making things. They take our foods, turn them into everything from neurotransmitters and organic acids and enzymes, some important vitamins and, and so on. And those are called postbiotics because it comes after the organism. Mm -hmm. uh, and just as kind of ground rules here, maybe it'll help people if we say prebiotics are the foods that the bacteria eat. Probiotics are the bacteria that are good for us. Postbiotics are what they have made out of what they've eaten. Okay. So then the prebiotics would also be just as important as taking the probiotics to then feed the good bacteria that you've introduced? I would say they might be more important okay. because <clears throat> you can only take so many probiotic supplements. Mm -hmm. And um, we might circle back and talk about this again, but just briefly, if you take a, a product that has 50 billion that sounds like an awful lot. I mean, we're comparing that with like our budget or something. Mm -hmm. um, but if you t this 
helps us understand, I think. If you take 100 organisms, just 100, and you feed them well, they double every in number every 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So in 24 hours, you're talking about quadrillions. So the, the 50 billion that you go here and there, uh, they just don't make that much of an impact. What mm -hmm. makes the biggest impact is feeding your good bacteria what they like to eat and not killing them off with a whole bunch of kinds of things that we'll probably talk about. Okay. Um, all right, so you've laid out a couple pieces there. I guess maybe first question is, um, what is it that the good bacteria like to eat? How can we feed them, keep them strong? All of those foods that we've been told, hey, these are really good for you, the ones that we don't eat, the ones that don't come in boxes and bags and cans in the middle of the grocery store, vegetables, uh, they like fibers, and they like fibers mostly from a variety of foods. Mm. And they like spices, they like herbs, and uh, they will adapt to whatever real food you eat. Mm -hmm. um, they can become accustomed to eating meat. You don't have to be a vegetarian to make them happy. But they like a wide variety because there are a wide variety of them and they all have special tastes. Mm -hmm. And when they eat different foods, they make different things. So when we talk about diversity of the bacteria in our intestinal tract, that's a really, really important thing. Mm -hmm. So not only eating, you know, one type of vegetable, but having a variety of different foods in, in the diet. Um, I think a lot of times people, um, you know, we, we gravitate towards the, the easiest solution, so to speak. So, you know, I've um, worked with people who are like, oh, I was told to eat more vegetables, so now I eat a cup of broccoli once a week or something like that. It's like, well, <laughs> certainly better than nothing, but you want to diversify the vegetables you're eating. And then do you have a recommendation of, you know, how many servings of vegetables per day that people should be aiming for? You know, they say eat your colors, and they're not talking about gummy bears you know, <laughs> or Skittles, something that's brightly colored like that. Um, every one of them has their pluses and minuses. Mm. Uh, for example, broccoli. Broccoli's great. If you ate a lot of broccoli every single day, your thyroid gland wouldn't like it very much. Mm. It's a, a goitrogen. Um, so uh, the official recommendations are like 9 to 11 servings. Most of the country doesn't get anywhere near 5. Yeah. And they're being generous about what they consider a fruit and a vegetable. Mm. You know, a glass of orange juice is mostly sugar. I mean, right. it's got some, some good stuff in it, but you wouldn't sit down and eat five or six oranges, but you could drink that many pretty easily in a, right. in a tall glass. Um, and the spices, around the world, I think one of the reasons that a lot of populations are much healthier than we are, and we are somewhere 37th down the list of of healthy, I mean, given that we spend more on it than anybody else by a lot, right. we're way down, like number 37, is because we don't really include herbs and spices. We aren't doing turmeric and and ginger and garlic to the extent that other, other cultures are. Mm -hmm. And those are things that the bacteria really like. Interesting. So another great, you know, kind of upside to... Um, eating more foods with those herbs and spices is that you're also flavoring your food um, to make it taste better and more appealing. Um, and in a lot of cases, you can actually reduce uh, the salt that you're adding or, you know, those, those other less healthy components that we turn to for flavor, like salt and sugar, um, can actually be greatly reduced by using herbs and spices for, you know, giving that flavor to our foods. Um, you mentioned ginger, garlic, turmeric. Are there any other spices that you recommend to people or any personal favorites of yours? 
Um, I will give you the replacing sugar because we don't need, we have no nutritional need for sugar and it causes a lot of aggravation. But can I do a little mini rant on salt? Yeah. Um, I, th I think the government and the big organizations have gotten a little carried away on salt. You can actually make yourself pretty sick by not getting enough salt. Mm. And a very few, a very small percentage of the population suffers high blood pressure because of too much salt. Now, I mean, you can get carried away and eat 10 grams a day, but trying to get it down to 15 or 17, that will make you sick. So mm. that's probably another show. But I couldn't let it go by without, it's easy to say, yes, well, you can substitute for them, but don't overdo that either. Right. The, the herbs, um, any uh, vegetable can kind of be turned into an herb, the garlic and the onions. Um, I, I think uh, ginger's one that is my personal favorite. Mm. I actually make, I put whole ginger roots in a blender, cover them with water, and turn it on high, and then just strain out the pulp. Uh, really adds a a lot to meals and mm -hmm. to my smoothies and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, garlic is miraculous. Uh, there's one company that makes aged garlic extract, Kyolic. They have done 760 studies on it for everything from blood pressure to um, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, you name it. Um, Really, uh, there's miracles in these things if they're properly prepared. By aging it, they make it more potent and they make it so it doesn't taste like garlic. So you wouldn't use that for for spices. But they used garlic in the Middle Ages to ward off the um, the plague. And I think a lot of these things, and be it goji berries or a lot of the things we hear, oh, well, that's you know something really good, pomegranates. They don't do the work that we expect them to do until the bacteria have worked on them. Mm. And they have to be operated on and not just smushed and broken down. They have to actually be transformed from turmeric into curcumin, for example. Uh, and the bacteria do that. So you need both. You need to feed them, but they need to be there. You can't have killed them off by whatever you did before that. Mm-hmm. And that kind of uh, maybe uh, harkens back to the previous podcast we did talking about acid blockers and how by uh, reducing your stomach acid with, you know, Nexium, Prilosec, all of these different protein pump inhibitors, you're actually reducing your, you know, uh, your body's ability to absorb those nutrients in the food that you're eating. So kind of adding insult to injury, a mm -hmm. lot of folks out there are, you know, maybe they're taking the protein, uh, the proton pump inhibitors, but then they're also eating um, maybe some of the foods that are known to disrupt the gut biome. Maybe we can go into some of those. And so not only are they not able to absorb what little nutrition they are taking in, um, but you're also kind of affecting your body's ability to get rid of all those other toxins and maybe less favorable elements that are in the diet. Oh, for sure. Because if you, if you kill off your good bacteria, either by feeding them foods that they don't like. And we talked about ones that they do like. What they don't like are, are the artificial ingredients that are in mm -hmm. foods, the preservatives, which just on the face of it, hmm, preservatives, they're to kill bacteria. Um, but also artificial colors, flavors, all kinds of, of, mm -hmm. um, of emulsifiers even in ice cream. Uh, all of those kinds of chemical things are not what they're accustomed to what they're supposed to be eating. So when you don't have the good bacteria, they can't take that pomegranate and pull out the magical ingredient that's in it that you see all the studies on. Oh, pomegranate's good for this or that. But some people won't benefit because they don't have the good bacteria. They've killed them off with bad foods, uh, with chemicals, medications, virtually all medications are hard on your good bacteria. Mm. 
Interesting. And then is it true that um, the artificial sweeteners like aspartame and Splenda, how do those affect the microbiome of the gut? Yeah, I've seen the studies on Splenda that it kills good bacteria, and I think, well, that makes a lot of sense. Let's do a yogurt, take the sugar out so that we won't have the sweetness, put Splenda in. So we're taking a yogurt for the purpose of getting the bacteria, and then we're putting something in there that kills them. So, I, you know, I, I can't really find anything good to say about artificial sweeteners. Mm. They don't help you lose weight. Um, they tend to make you more hungry over time. Mm -hmm. uh, they're bad on the good bacteria, not so good on the nervous system. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, frankly, it's hard to tell something that has reputation for being bad for you. Is it bad for you directly or indirectly because it goes down, kills your good bacteria that are supposed to be doing some job for you. Mm -hmm. But in any case, we have no nutritional need for sugar or artificial sugar. Right. If you're going to do something like that, if you don't already know, uh, stevia is a much better solution. Right. Or, you know, a lot of times... Or a um, date. Yeah. <laughs> Eat a date. <laughs> you know, sometimes um, for myself, I'll opt for, you know, like the honey or pure maple syrup as, you know, something that... Um, can definitely fill that sweet tooth, so to speak, but then you're also getting the other nutritional values in, in contained in those foods. Um, are those easier on the body, or are those natural sources of sugar also going to be uh, harmful for the gut? Um, one problem with natural sweeteners, really more so fruit, uh, not so much honey, um, is that it feeds yeast in mm. the intestinal tract. The, um, it doesn't kill bacteria directly like the chemical sweeteners do. Uh, you certainly can get enough of them to upset your blood sugar. Mm. But I think the big thing is the, um, you, you don't want a lot of starches and sweets and sweet fruits because they feed yeast that take over space in the intestinal tract. Mm. Uh, they create chemicals called mycotoxins that poison the good bacteria, and um, they can go all over the body. Uh, candida yeast is the one that people are the most familiar with, but these yeast, when they create these mycotoxins, it's the same kind of toxin that's on, on uh, corn. You hear about it in the... Uh, in agriculture that the fungus is a big problem and it can create poisons well it does that in your gut and it can cause so many symptoms that people would never connect headache boggy brain aching joints rashes fatigue all kinds of things that are due to too much yeast in the gut mm. and you have made them a happy home by feeding them what they like. And this is the really insidious part. They make chemicals that make you crave sweets. Oh, no. Very evolved. They know how to get you to order lunch for them. Wow. So then your sugar cravings that you're having are actually coming from those yeast in your gut kind of going, hey, I'm going to trump the system, so to speak, of cravings yeah, and forget, make you crave these Forget sweets. the broccoli. Bring me a donut. I mean, they know what they want. And wow. it's part of their life cycle, and it's, it, it works for them. It just mm -hmm. doesn't work for us. Right. But if you can stay off of all that stuff that they like to eat for even a week, you'll notice something very different. You can still walk by that donut and say, yeah, I know those taste good, but you won't be like, must have donut, mm. you know, where somebody else is controlling you. Right, where you actually just feel like so strongly compelled well, towards yeah, that Well, yeah, it's like it's going to save your life or something. It's a, it's a different order of you're not, you're not really hungry. You are just flat craving something like if you don't get it, maybe, you know, all's not right with the world. Mm. Interesting. So definitely for anyone listening that, you know, experiences really so strong sugar cravings, um, is there a recommendation you can give of how someone could um, determine if they have an overgrowth of yeast? 
in the gut that's maybe the culprit of those very cravings? Yeah. Um, well, the best way is to just stop eating the, the sweet stuff. Um, just temporarily, fruits, any, <clears throat> anything starchy, anything sugary, uh, just stop. And if you get a headache, that's a clue. Okay. Because they will start dying off, and when they die off, they give off these mycotoxins. I have a, actually a, on my website in the library, I have a whole library of articles. There's one in digestion on yeast where you can take a, um, a survey. Okay. And it, it'll have a whole bunch of the clues. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a, you can go to the doctor and get some really expensive testing and not find out any more than you can by just taking that paper pencil survey and cutting down and see if you feel better. And there is nothing, if you were wrong and you didn't have yeast and you cut out sugar and starch and the sweeter fruits, not going to hurt a thing. It will probably help something. Right. Right. And that, um, you know, whole piece of the fogginess, mind, um, foggy Bo mind. Boggy brain. Boggy brain. You know, that is such a, um, such a common thing now. I think there's a lot of people that are just operating under that, you know, fatigue. Um, you know, the mind is not clear. The mind is not functioning the way it's supposed to. Um, and when people do make that little transition to their diet, like you said, just for a week, a couple days, if that feels more reasonable, you start to notice those things. And people will say, wow, I never realized that my mind was so foggy. I never, mm -hmm. you know, I had been living with this for so long, you kind of dull the senses, so to speak, to, you know. Yeah, it's the new normal. Uh, if you really find you have been eating a lot, of, you're drinking sodas and juices and eating something sweet or starchy at every meal and at snacks, you might want to taper off a little bit and avoid mm. some of the really crappy feeling that you might have from the withdrawal okay. from it. But um, I just wonder how many times that boggy brain and that feeling uh, just sort of out of sorts and it can make you, and you're tired, make you sad, they go to the doctor and they get an antidepressant. Mm. And then we're off to the races with all kinds of other side effects. So um, it's a very simple thing to do to clean up that part of your diet. And one of the other things about those kinds of foods, especially the ones in the center part of the grocery store, the sugared cereals with the the colors and, and so on is that they, and the cookies, they keep bad company. It isn't just the sugar in it that's going to feed the yeast. Uh, anything that you can ferment and um, make jailhouse wine out of, anything that will ferment is something that the yeast like. Um, is that they keep bad company. They, they hang around with artificial colors, artificial flavors, preservatives, flow agents of various kinds. Um, and even some of the manufactured nutrients, I think, ultimately interfere with our body's ability to absorb the correct ones. Right. Like the enriched wheat flour, so to speak. That what is an the insidious biggest joke. Yeah, what an insidious name. Oh, we're gonna call it enriched. So people think that it's even better than regular flour. But realistically, the only reason that they end up adding those nutrients, those synthetic nutrients back in, because then the label will say, contains enri enriched wheat flour, and then it has all these nutrients they add to it. They have to add those nutrients in just so your body can even vaguely start digesting that, you know, enriched flour. Um, well, it's um, not much of a bargain. They take out something like 26 nutrients and then put six of them back. Mm. And in a different form right. that isn't so easy to use. But they had to put some of those in because they were actually creating deficiency diseases. And in, in the first world, we should never have deficiency diseases. We have insufficiency diseases, but flat out scurvy, berry, berry rickets, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, you think of that only being in the third world. But if you start eating a lot of bread that's had all that stripped out of it, uh, there's a lot of that going on, like 
with iodine, something that we need for our thyroid. And they take that out of the bread, speaking of bread, and use bromides instead. And the bromide competes with the iodine. So then people start getting goiter and they have problems with their thyroid. And they don't, they don't blame it on Wonder Bread. Right. Well, I think it's interesting how, you know, as much as the gut is really central to, you know, all of these other functions the body's doing, we often just don't associate, like, that my, you know, mental clarity issues could be coming from my gut, Mm -hmm. you know, are all, you know, kind of talked about those different symptoms. Um, Interestingly, I think that people... Um, you know, like you said, they're getting most of their education on nutrition from the advertisements they see on TV or from the little symbols on the front of the cereal boxes, um, whether it's, you know, contains 13 grams of whole grains. But then when you read the ingredients, the first ingredient is enriched flour. And then maybe they also put in a little bit of whole wheat flour as well so that they can put on the Mm -hmm. label that it has whole grains in it. Um, and you know, I, I've I've been uh, <laughs> the person who spends four hours in the grocery store reading every label, reading every label, and just being overwhelmed to see that that enriched flour is in almost everything, um, and sugar. It's it's shocking, uh, and corn syrup. Which mm-hmm. here's another one that really af- directly affects our good bacteria. Um, You can use mercury. Uh, Old-timers will know that you use mercurochrome uh, on a cut that mercury kills bacteria. There is now mercury in high fructose corn syrup because it's put in there not accidentally, although I'm sure that we, we have it everywhere because it's in the air, but it's put in on purpose in the processing to kill bacteria, but then the mercury residues are still there. So the more that you eat things that have high fructose corn syrup in them, the more mercury you're taking in, more than if you got mercury fillings in your teeth. Wow. And, yeah, and I I interviewed uh, Dr. Defoe, who was a, a, a food scientist for the FDA, and she discovered how this was happening she took it to the superiors, and they told her to stop investigating that, or she would be fired or sued. By so, the FDA. Yeah, by the FDA. Who is there to protect us? Yes. So, she uh, did the only thing she could do. She quit and formed a foundation. Um, but you're taking in these things along with the other things that are in these cereals, the the uh, uh, glyphosate pesticides, which are very, very harmful for our good bacteria, and you're taking in the mercury, and then there are all the other chemicals they add on, on purpose. Um, so you can either read all of those ingredient lists and freak out about it, or you can go to the produce department, hmm, cucumber, no labels. Right. Yeah, I mean, usually you do have to peel off the wax they put on it, but, I mean, mm-hmm. at least it's a vegetable. It's one ingredient. Right, and you don't have to read ingredient lists. Because no. I tell you what, it only took me a couple of four, four-and-a-half-hour grocery store trips that I started saying, all right. <laughs> there has to be an easier way. <laughs> there, yeah, there has to be an easier way. And it is to just, like you said, avoid those center aisles of the grocery store, avoid those long ingredient lists. Because, you know, on one hand, there's just far too many ingredients and chemicals for any person to keep track of. So even if you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to avoid the enriched flour and the high fructose corn syrup and the um, GMO maltodextrin or whatever, you start noticing that it's in so many things. Yeah, now you're back to the produce department, except that there are there are some things that are like nuts. You, you can't mm. just wipe out the whole center part, but that's where mm-hmm. most of the real trouble is. But um, people like things sweet. Um, I've noticed lately in the produce department even, all of the labels are sweet this and honey that. The the names, they're breeding them to be sweeter. Mm. Uh, our ancestors, they had an apple that was about the size of a tennis ball, and it wasn't very sweet. Now, it can weigh two pounds, um, you know, or at least a pound, really mm-hmm. big apples, and they're very, very sweet. 
So we have to really watch ourselves. We don't want to feed the yeast right. that uh, can cause all those problems because um, yeah, if, if, if you eat half a Granny, Granny Smith apple, that's not going to be a big problem for you. But if you eat one of those great big ones and it's after you had breakfast cereal and you got bread on your sandwich at lunch and you got pretzels in the afternoon and you got pasta for dinner and you got dessert... Now it's just it, it causes many problems, but mm. we're talking in this case about the yeast. The yeast also, and some of the other things that we do that are bad for our good bacteria, create a condition called um, excessive permeability of the lining of the intestinal tract. The kind of street term for it is leaky gut. Street and, term, I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's kind of medical slang. It's uh, mm-hmm. leaky gut. Well, that that just makes sense to people. They understand what it is. Right. When that happens, things that are supposed to get through the nutrients don't. Things that aren't supposed to get through, little pieces of some you know wheat that's not totally digested goes through milk, something like that, and certain organisms that aren't supposed to get through. They get into circulation. And then, lo and behold, we have 100 and counting, well, the last was like 107 or something, autoimmune diseases. You know what they all have in common? They all say, no known cause, no known cure. Well, I'll tell you where the cause is. It's in the gut. Wow. And that what sets it off is the, the leaky gut because then you have these things circulating through the blood that the immune system says, I don't know what that is, and it mounts an attack, and then there's collateral damage or uh, it attacks something that looks a little bit like your joint. Next thing you've got rheumatoid arthritis mm-hmm. or lupus or some other autoimmune condition. Interesting. And, you know, the kind of overarching, arcing message that is kind of coming through is that virtually all of the processed foods, or at least most of them, that contain these different chemicals um, are all kind of creating this assault on our gut and leading to that um, increased permeability or leaky gut, so to speak. Um, If you could make an estimation of how many people you think you know, how, how common is it for people to actually have this permeability of the gut um, going on in their body? Well, they don't look for it, so it's hard to know. But um, if you just count up all the people who have something that's called an autoimmune disease, whether it's autoimmune thyroiditis or something like that, um, I don't know, wild guess I'd say half the population. It's not a minor problem at all. Mm-hmm. And it and it's to degrees. I mean, some people are a lot leakier. They've had it longer. They've had a more severe reaction to it. Um, but it's, um, I, I have a picture. I just should probably do a cartoon of this little bacteria down in your gut saying, oh, no, here come the yeast. There come the chlorine in the water. Oh, another drug. There comes a preservative. Oh, there's some glyphosate pesticide. How do they do it? I mean, I'm impressed that they hang in there as well as Mm. they do. Right. So um, perhaps that brings us to the question of how do we restore the microbiome? How do we um, help restore that uh, selective permeability of the gut lining to its optimal function? Well, that is the million-dollar question, and it <clears throat> the microbiome, and we never really defined it, but it's not just the bacteria in your gut. It's the good bacteria and the bad bacteria. It's the, it's the yeast, it's the viruses, and other critters that are hard to describe, but it's all of that flora and fauna that's in the intestinal tract. And so you want to keep a balance of at least 85% good guys. So we would, uh, if, if you went to the doctor and they said, oh, well, maybe you do have yeast, their approach would be just to kill the yeast, but you have to simultaneously build up the good guys. Mm. And I think step one is stop killing them off if you can. 
Mm. Um, and I'd like to get to antibiotics if we have time because that's a really big one. But, um, you know, watch anything that you're doing that you might be killing them. That'll make it easier. Feed them more vegetables. Feed them more um, spices. Uh, feed them fermented foods of various kinds. And that's, um, whether it's kimchi or real sauerkraut, not the bottled pickle kind in the middle of the grocery store, but the kind that's either you make at home or that's in the refrigerated section. Um, all, and lots of Asian foods that are, are fermented. Those not only bring good bacteria, they also make the things that the bacteria have made, the postbiotics that I mentioned at the top of the show, um, those are there, and they help change the environment in the intestinal tract mm. so that all the good guys can survive wow. and, and flourish. And <clears throat> taking probiotics helps. I'm not a huge fan of, of ganging up on the white powdered kind of, of uh, probiotics and capsules. If you could get enough of those to really make a dent, I think it would annoy the immune system because they're not used to seeing a whole raft of one organism or even six organisms come because they're used to having <coughs> thousands of different kinds. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> Uh, having a little bit of them on a regular basis is is probably a good thing. Um, I'm much more like a concentrated fermented food because it has the foods that the bacteria eat. It has well-researched strains, and they've been fermented for three years creating all of these things. One of the vitamins that they create, uh, I think it's really interesting, people don't know about really like they should is vitamin K2 and that's a vitamin that helps calcium uh, on the other podcast we talked about calcium and, and bones it helps calcium get into the bones where it belongs and not into the arteries where it creates hardening of the arteries wow. that's vitamin K2 well it needs a better press agent because we don't really hear about it. But one of the ways we get that is that our bacteria make it for us wow. uh, along with um, more melatonin than is made in the pineal gland, more serotonin than is made in the brain. Uh, lots of stuff going on down there. And the more we appreciate it, the more we have to think uh, it's more than like being pregnant where you're eating for two. You're eating for trillions. So you have to really think about mm -hmm. are we putting good things down there or not. There was a, um, a, a nurse, Tana, Tana Amen, her husband's a pretty famous doctor. Uh, she was on the show, and she said, I tell my daughter, think of them as pets. You have to you know, f feed them and water them and take care of them and don't give them bad stuff. And I thought that's a really good way to look at it. I like that. I like that a lot. I think about uh, when I was a kid, we had these little, like before there were video games for cell phones, there were these little like nano pets. Mm -hmm. But it was like this little, and you would take care of it and you had to feed it. And if it got sick, it would, you know, light up and tell you and you'd have to, you know, do something for it or whatever. So I kind of like this visualization of, you know, yeah. tending to our gut bacteria just like our little pets. <laughs> Ooh, that, you know, there might be a, a, a new version of that. I'll have to think about how we can get one of those made. And it's the, the pet or your bacteria. And what have you done today to make them better or worse? Right. Um, you know, so we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, yogurts and that a lot of our knowledge of good and bad bacteria actually came from mm -hmm. uh, these yogurt commercials that I think, you know, most people are familiar with now. Um, but is yogurt... Um, an, an ideal source of probiotics, or is it a sufficient source of probiotics um, for people who might say, oh, well, I eat two yogurts a day or something like that? Is that yeah. doing the job? Well, no and no, but it's not necessarily bad if you're tolerant of dairy. It's not bad, but you have you know, maybe two, three different organisms in there. They, they have to pasteurize it, so then they add the organisms after they've made the yogurt. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're not bad, they're, they're helpful, and fermented dairy has a pretty good reputation. But if we have um, 
5,000 different kinds and you're taking a little bit of three, I mean, you can pretty well see that that's not going to be enough. Mm. You're going to need more. Right. And uh, <clears throat> that's... Uh, it's not a bad thing to do. Like I say, it's, I don't like the sugar that's in it, the ones that are sweet with fruits. If you're, getting, if you're going to do yogurt, ideally make your own. You know what you're getting. Um, but a, an unsweetened Greek yogurt without any artificial mm. sweeteners is, is better. The ones that taste like dessert really are. Right. right. And don't, don't fall for that. It bears repeating, don't fall for the, well, we took out the sugar and put in an artificial sweetener because that's worse. It's worse. Um, do you have a, a probiotic that you recommend that you can share with us? I do. In the book, I cover several different kinds. If you just want a, um, well, for, for example, there are specialized kinds. Like uh, Jaro Formulas has one that's, uh, the organisms are specifically for female health. They help with vaginal yeast infections and uh, urinary tract infections. Uh, there's another one uh, by Reg Active, R E G apostrophe A C T I V. That one, uh, researched extensively in Europe, it creates, a, implants this bacteria called ME3 that generates, makes, and recycles glutathione, which is the premier antioxidant mm -hmm. that in turn supports vitamin C and vitamin E and all the other antioxidants. And so it turns it into a little factory so you don't have to take pills for it because wow. Glutathione pills are not very effective. They get broken down. Um, for a base, um, my favorite is Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. I've used that with my uh, clients back since they first started bringing it to the U.S. Mm. And it's, it's because it has a dozen strains, but it also has the remnants of all of the dozens of organic and natural foods that they've been feeding them, no dairy, no wheat, no soy. And it has over, I mean, you know this comes from Japan because we don't have this kind of, of a attention span in the U.S. It takes three years to make it because mm. they, they keep feeding seasonally whatever fruits and vegetables are in season, they feed these bacteria aerate them, and at the end of that time, they have made, they've now identified 400 postbiotics that these bacteria have made, mm -hmm. all of these um, organic acids and enzymes and uh, amino acids and trans whatever's, uh, <laughs> just a ton of, of different things. And those are all the things, the reason we want the bacteria to begin with is for what they make. Well, mm -hmm. that gives you a head start. And it also, just like fermented foods do, helps to uh, give you a good environment for your other bacteria. I actually had the opportunity when I was in Japan one time, I wanted to go see the place where they make it. Mm -hmm. And this will sound a little silly, but I, I went in and I was just amazed. It was all very pristine and they had these tubs and they, they were aerating them and it was, it's a black goo when it's done. It's not any resemblance to the white powder at all that are all just freeze-dried individual organisms. And I, I said, well, you know, that is so nice. They're playing Mozart for the employees. And the guy looked at me like I was wacko. That's not for the employees. That's for the bacteria. Those wow. vibrations make them more vigorous. Wow. So that's how different it is. That's yeah. why I, you know, I, I keep going back to that one. Mm. Um, when, I, when I wrote The Probiotic Cure, I looked at a thousand abstracts to try to go back to square one. What do we know? Where is it headed? What are the common denominators? And started with kind of, well, we started with killing them off, and where are we now, and so on. And um, I found uh, there are good ones. There's one that, um, and name escapes me at the moment, but it's a it's a liquid one that you buy in little shots, and it's not your cult, it's the other one, uh, that they give in the hospital, in this one hospital in Canada. Anytime they give them an antibiotic, they give them that. 
they have none of that C. diff, C. difficile, that terrible mm. disease that you can get in the hospital, especially after antibiotics, and that they then uh, don't have um, life-threatening diarrhea from it. Wow. Why isn't that contagious? Why don't all the hospitals do it? I don't know. But um, there, are, there are good ones here and there, uh, and the more food-like they are, the better. Okay. But Is it necessary to have um, a probiotic that requires refrigeration? Is that, because I've heard that that's a good sign to know that you have a good probiotic. What that's a good sign of is that it's very fragile. Okay. And that it has to be in the refrigerator because they have freeze-dried, well, first they culture um, virtually all the bacteria overnight and separate them from the milk or whatever they were grown on, break up the colonies, and then they m mix a batch of, of this strain and that strain and that strain. They mix them together and put it in a capsule after it's freeze-dried and ship it off and you don't want them to wake up because they'll fight each other because they've never seen each other before. And um, if they get any moisture or warmth, then they die and they don't wake up again. So um, if you're talking about, unless it's coated in some way, there are some that say you don't have to. The, the reason that Dr. O'Hara's doesn't need to be refrigerated is that it's it's when I was in there listening to the Mozart, it was ambient temperature. That's what they're used to. They're mm -hmm. grown on that. Mm -hmm. And they're safely inside this capsule with their food supply. So they're happy. Okay. They're happy until you turn them loose. I often will chew them because it's immediate help for any kind of a stomach upset or or heartburn and and so on. Wow. Uh, but it's a... it's common knowledge that you should get one that's in the refrigerator, but that's, you know, there's an asterisk there. That's not if it's a properly made fermented food. It's a different thing. Wow. Very interesting. And then so the Dr. O'Hara's, does that also include the prebiotics? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If they've fed them several dozen foods, some of that food is still in there. Okay. And they are, they are the kinds of foods we should be eating and we're not. Right. Um, could we talk about antibiotics? Yes, let's do. Let's do. You can um, start if you want. But. So, you know, I've heard, um, you know, the recommendation to take probiotics um, after a course of antibiotics to help replenish the gut biome. Is that an accurate recommendation? On the way to being accurate. Um, I heard a doctor once tell a lady that she had taken an antibiotic and she was afraid she was going to get a yeast infection. He said, eh, eat a yogurt next week, you'll be fine. Well, no. Um, after a course of antibiotics, it takes up to a year to reestablish a normal microbiome. And that's assuming that it hasn't made you sick in some other way and you don't end up taking another antibiotic and some people end up taking them end to end. But you want to start hopefully before you have the antibiotic, maybe you won't need it, but you want to take it at the same time and not the same time of day, just c concurrently. Okay. But people have uh, a little worry that, well, antibiotic, probiotic, maybe I'm going to interfere with the antibiotic, actually makes it work better. The problem is the reverse. You don't want to take the antibiotic at the same time as the probiotic because you'll kill the probiotic. So you allow at least two, three hours between them, but you really want to double up. And there's another probiotic that I recommend if you if you are going to take an antibiotic. It's a friendly yeast called Saccharomyces boulardii, mm -hmm. S. boulardii, and you can get that at any health food store. That's uh, and this friendly yeast, it's not bothered by the antibiotic, so it's a good placeholder. It'll mm -hmm. get down there and kind of keep things in good good order. I take that along with Dr. O'Hara's. And uh, another one off the shelf, uh, you know, out of the refrigerator, a dozen, 50 billion strain or whatever, you can take those. Um, double up and okay. continue for months after the antibiotic because it does such severe damage. Wow.
So taking the probiotics concurrently with the antibiotics, but a couple hours apart, two to yes. three hours apart. Yes. Um, maybe even doubling up <laughs> our probiotics. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, there's a lot of different you know, marketing out there on the on the labels, you know, uh, 12 different strains, 50 billion um, units or whatever. W what is a good thing for people to look for? I mean, there's so many probiotics out there now. <laughs> Do you have any little, you know, guidelines that people can use to know, you know, if they're taking a good one or not? Yeah, I once heard Dr. Oz say, oh, get one that has 25 billion. I looked, when I was looking through those thousand abstracts. I didn't see a single one that said anything about the count. That was just, I don't know, out of the ethers. Um, I, I go back to that thing about, well, 12 strains is better than two. Mm. Um, you get much beyond that. You get ones that haven't been very well researched. So I think 12 is probably a good number. They the, Good statistics on those. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the number, uh, it's much more important to get a good one and have them have the food supply that they need mm. because, as I said, if you, if you take a 100 organisms doubling every 30 minutes, you've got way beyond government numbers overnight. Right. And it's like a, I had to do a spreadsheet to say it's like doubling a penny for a month, uh, if you've ever done that. Uh, I, I had to look it up and find out, well, what do you call it when it has that many zeros? And it was a quadrillion. So um, I'm not really impressed with 50 billion. I, you know, if there's four in there, it's probably not going to do anything. But mm. um, you have to take it regularly and whatever you're going to take. I always like to start with get the diet as good as you can, try to stop killing them off, um, use Dr. O'Hara's probiotic as a base then take whatever you want on that. And it, it's not the cheapest one out there, so if you have to take one every other day, at least you're kind of re-inoculating the, mm. the environment. Then then when you take one of the 12 strain 50 billions, it's going to have a place to, to live. When it gets down there, it'll be a little better. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there are bad ones out there. There's Here and there, there's some nonsense articles. One I like came out and for some reason, I guess it's man bites dog, but when there's an article showing probiotics don't work or that there's uh, some adverse effect, there was one that said taking a probiotic made somebody um, foggy or, you know, kind of gave him boggy brain and I went, well, probably killed off some yeast and you're going to get boggy brain. It was a, a die-off effect. Mm. But they aren't looking for that. And that's right. the thing with with the science. You only get answers to the questions that you ask. Right. And then another, you know, I think important piece when you're looking at these different studies that have been done is that there's always somebody who had to fund that study. And if you can figure out who it was that funded it, that right there will tell you so much about that information. Because if you have a pharmaceutical that's funding the study, you know, about the safety of probiotics or, you know, how I've seen, you know, so many people ask, well, where are the scientific studies about how, uh, <laughs> how vegetables help, help you or whatever? And I said, I like what you said earlier, you know, the vitamin K2 needs a better press agent. You know, there's not an industry, billion dollar industry, behind the vegetables and the nutrients and the natural things to fund studies about them. So by and large, those different studies that you come across are probably funded by big food or by big pharma, and then they're only going to publish the results that are potentially going to help them out. And then beyond that, they're only going to publicize the results and write articles about them and do news pieces on them or whatever, you know, if it's really going to be beneficial to them. Um, the emperor has no clothes, it would appear. <laughs> it's, you know, it's exactly what happens. And um, it, it's really sad and shocking that probably only half of the studies on drugs get published. Mm. The ones that that show a negative result to go in the deep freeze. Right. And 
um, there's a lot of bias in the journals and, and a lot of really f fine physicians that were in charge of those journals are now on the outside saying uh, it's being controlled now by the, the drug companies. Mm -hmm. they're, they're actually paying them to say what they want them to say. Right. I think there's also, um, you know, the element that um, all of the unseen effects, so to speak, that come from it. So like you said, you know, talking about uh, the different strains of bacteria in the gut and all of these little functions that they serve um, so that when you have a symptom like a headache, so to speak, Maybe that headache is not resulting from something bad happening, but from something good happening, like that yeast being killed off. Well, now the, you know, response or the symptom, which is maybe unfavorable or unpleasant, um, is actually a sign that your body's coming more into function and more into alignment um, and not necessarily telling you that, oh, this probiotic is bad. Yeah. Um, all of those kind of unseen elements are... Um, you know, it feels very overwhelming or it feels very confusing, I think, for a lot of people, but um, kind of as a reminder that the body is more complex than meets the eye. Um, and that if we are just trying to, you know, bring it back to the very basics, how do we give the body what it needs? I can't remember if it was this podcast or the last one you said, you know, give yeah. the body what it needs and don't gum up your system with all of this excess stuff it doesn't need. You kind of bring it back to basics and suddenly you can kind of, you know, get through some of those confusing pieces. That, re that really is the, the basics of, and I call it the prime directive for those that are like, Star Wars, uh, or was it Star Trek? I was good. Who had the prime directives? But I think it must have been Captain Kirk. Um, that if you give the body everything it needs, and it might need a lot more because maybe you need 10 times as much vitamin C as I do, so it isn't always easy to know what it is we need. Mm -hmm. That's why you overcompensate with supplements, which, by the way, are not proven like, even if they were, the FDA wouldn't let you say so, but Who's going to do a, a, a study on something that all the companies can make? They can't spend half a billion dollars to, to prove something through clinical trials and then everybody and their brother can make it. Mm. But you give the body everything it needs for optimum function and you don't overload it with too much sugar, with smoking, too much exercise, uh, too much sunlight, too much any of the toxins that mm. we encounter, too much alcohol, all of those things that weigh it down. And even genetics are prone to being moderated by the too much and the too little. If you're getting too much of something, you can trigger a gene to go into action that we don't want and vice versa. If you give the body something that it really needs, it can tone down and, and dampen a gene that was maybe going to do something we didn't like. Mm -hmm. um, very little of what bothers us is truly genetic. It's more epigenetic. It's how we treat our genes and what we tell them to do. Mm -hmm. Which of those genes get turned off or activated? Um, I think that piece in and of itself, you know, so many times people feel that they are um, you know, genetically, dis, you know, predisposed to X, Y, or Z. Um, but yeah, that epigenetic component of seeing how um, the body responds to the environment and even something as simple as, you know, these genes get turned on, these genes get turned off in response to these different dietary or lifestyle things. Or our microbiome. Um, they have something to do with what they're creating one of the things it does is send out good messages to mm -hmm. turn off genes that could cause trouble. Right. But um, I get a little excited about the genes, and, and then people start lopping off body parts because they don't want to get cancer in it when they're, there's very little evidence that that makes much of a difference in the long run. Right. Yeah, and, I mean, just in general, this idea of removing, you know, Tr trouble organs, so to speak, from the body. You know, um, we think a lot about uh, people get their appendants taken out. Uh, you had mentioned before we started, you know, the tonsils being taken out. 
Can you just speak a little bit to, you know, um, maybe what what roles these organs are actually playing and maybe what the effects are when we do something really extreme, like actually removing the entire organ? Yeah, the more I learn about it, the more respect I have for the original plan. I don't think we were given any odds and ends of organs that weren't needed. Uh, sometimes we have redundancy and we can, can get by without something, but that doesn't mean it didn't serve a purpose. Yeah, I, um, of course, didn't ha at six years old, didn't have any real choice in the matter whether or not I had my, my tonsils out, but as it turns out, tonsils and adenoids are part of the immune system, and they don't, they don't any longer just willy-nilly rip them out. They're also waking up to the fact that the appendix, unless it's rupturing and it's become life-threatening, they don't even want to take those out because they found that far from being something useless that was put in the body uh, along with other odds and ends of organs that weren't needed um, and could be uh, maybe sometimes we can work around and have some redundancy, but the appendix is, it turns out, functions as a starter set that like some of each of the bacteria are in there so that if we got uh, cholera or something and we had a massive, you get a colonoscopy or whatever, and it flushes everything out. Well, how does it get back in there with the same ones that were there before? They come out of the appendix. And they're trying now not to remove those, um, but rather to use antibiotics sometimes. Uh, they were able to keep from giving you an appendectomy. Interesting. And then... Out of curiosity, um, what about other antibacterial chemicals? So taking antibiotics internally, you know, as a clear way of resist, affecting them. Resist, resist. <laughs> what about, you know, the antibacterial soaps? Nowadays, I feel like, you know, especially among, um, you know, like if you're in a toy store or something like that, everything will say it's made out of antibacterial plastic, things like that. How do those things affect the, the gut microbiome? Well, uh, you're not eating the toys, so that's <laughs> something. Um, I, I don't really have a problem with the alcohol wipes. Mm -hmm. uh, the triclosan that was used in a lot of the antibacterial soaps, we, we have a microbiome on our hand. It's actually different than the one on our elbow or our earlobe. We have... The forensic scientists can tell not only whether you put your hand on the table or whether you put your hand or your elbow on the table, or was it me? So it's how different they are. And and we know that they help keep the skin healthy, so I'm not a fan of you really using anything but soap and water. But if you're in a grocery store, yeah, go ahead and wipe off the handle with the, with the alcohol wipe. Um, I did a fair amount of research in the book on um, on Purell, and it's saved some lives in the um, in war areas, um, and it it kills it just like washing does. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's absorbed into your skin and it's going to go through or hang around. It just wipes them off, and then that's kind of the end of it. Okay, so I don't. I really don't know about the toys. What they put in those to, to keep them. Um, but if you got a kid in daycare, the idea is appealing. It's just you want to make sure that so often this progress is one step forward and two backward when we find mm -hmm. out what we've done. Right, and I mean I think about you know depending on the age of the child, a lot of those toys do end up in the child's mouth. Yes, that's um, true. So you know I. I I'm just interested to see, um, you know, triclosan, for instance, that was something that, um, you know, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago I was doing research on tri triclosan. It just feels like there's always this big lag in time before oh, yeah. the mainstream comes out and says it. So when I see all these things like, oh, it's made out of antibacterial plastics or whatever, you just wonder, well... Ten years from now, are they going to find out that it was dangerous? Well, it's like BPA in all the plastics. It's mm -hmm. a hormone disruptor. They say, oh, not to worry. Now we don't use that. We use BPS. Well, it's probably worse. So yeah. um, 
Yeah. A good source for that kind of information is the Environmental Working Group, mm. ewg.org. Yeah. And um, they they have references, the, the Dirty Dozen, um, of the foods, if you can't afford to get everything organic, which ones. And when there's chemicals on foods to kill bugs, it kills your bugs. So um, eat organic as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And the, going to the environmental working group, you can get a list of the clean 15 and the, and the uh, dirty dozen. And, and so you can at least buy those organic. I have a, a, I printed out a standard grocery list that leads me through the market, and all the ones that I have to buy organic are in bold, so it mm -hmm. makes it easier. Right. But um, they also rank skincare products and things like that. Right now, their big thing is the um, glyphosate, and it probably is a whole other show, but uh, the GMOs and the glyphosate. Uh, just know that none of that does your good bacteria any good at all. Right. And, you know, it's interesting in this country that genetically modified foods are not labeled. Um, so I think that there's, um, you know, in and of itself, that is very telling. Why, if these things were so safe, well, then why not label it? Why not tell us the foods that contain it? Um, interestingly, there's also this, you know, component. Somebody said to me once, um, well, people would be horrified. If you walked into the grocery store and 95% of the foods didn't say non-GMO, they said contains GMOs, we would be alarmed, you know, to realize how pervasive these GMOs are. Um, and, you know, the genetic modification as just maybe a, you know, a part of the problem. So the whole reason that those things are genetically modified is so they can spray them with the pesticides, yeah. with the glyphosate. So when you have something non-GMO, not only is it telling you that the DNA of that food has not been genetically altered, um, but it also tells you that it hasn't been sprayed with, with the glyphosate, which, as you exactly. said, has its own big slew of, of negative effects on the gut. No, for sure. And uh, GMOs, um, they, they are, you can just about assume anything in the middle of the grocery store, not so much in produce, but they're, they're using, um, in a lot of places that I didn't think, I did a fair amount in the probiotic cure talking about it, and there was one thing where they genetically modified these, like aquarium fish to be these fluorescent colors. I said, well, that's, that's kind of cute. That doesn't bother me at all. Just don't be breeding in insecticides into my foods mm. because th have they done years of careful research on that? No. It's just like with the glyphosate. They say, oh, well, you know, if you have it a, you know, for a week, it's not going to hurt you. Well, what if you have a little bit on your breakfast cereal every day for years? Mm -hmm. They don't research that. It's up right. to us to err on the side of caution. Right. And interestingly, you know, again, coming back to that idea of if, you know, if the genetically modified foods were labeled, we would just be completely appalled to realize well. how common those things are. And because they're not labeled, we as consumers really don't have any way of knowing how much we're consuming them. I'm, mm -hmm. you know, very fortunate here in um, Austin, there's a great, you know, kind of natural health community here. So there actually are um, places where you can find those non-GMO foods or even restaurants where you can find that non-GMO certification. Um, but interestingly, the way that they, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the way that they um, kind of began was, um, you know, they want to spray more of the pesticides on the foods, but they don't want to kill the foods. Mm -hmm. They just want to kill the pests. And so there is actually um, a barrel of Roundup um, that was, uh, there was a, I think a bacterial strain that was growing on the barrel. And they said, oh, hey, that can survive the Roundup. And so they actually took the DNA from the bacteria and put it in the food. And that's how they impart the um, resistance 
to round up. I hadn't heard that study, but it makes perfect sense um, that they would do that. And th other countries are are ahead of us mm -hmm. on this. Right. They don't just accept things like that without challenge. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we can hope. They're doing not just uh, herbicides now. I mean, they want to be able to use it to avoid having to weed like farmers, you know, actual farmers do. Mm. They, uh, they want to do this industrial farming where they don't have to weed, so they just spray this weed killer on it, and it, if it's a resistant crop, then the crop doesn't die. But they're also spraying it now to dry crops out at the end of the year, they, and they spray antibiotics. I mean, we know we're getting secondhand antibiotics through meats and, and dairy products that mm. are not organic, but I was really distressed to find out they also spray them on crops, on produce. Wow. So the more you can eat organic, the better. And the more you can eat foods that you can identify without having to get out a magnifying glass, and <laughs> so much the better. Yeah. Yeah. The best way to uh, avoid wasting your time combing through those long ingredient lists just buy the food without the long ingredient list in the first yeah. place, and then you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> and, and if you aren't much at cooking, um, uh, even I can steam some broccoli and bake a chicken and mm -hmm. peel a cucumber. I mean, you don't have to right. create uh, really exotic meals with all kinds of miscellaneous ingredients in it that your bacteria are down there saying, no, no, don't do that. <laughs> and it's interesting, you know, kind of going back to at the, you know, the beginning of our conversation, talking about the herbs and spices, um, you know, using a little bit of, um, you know, different spice blends, different flavors, um, does so much to take something, you know, maybe really simple like steamed broccoli or, or whatever, um, and really unlock a huge amount of flavor. And I think that that is something that people, um, you know, like you said, depending on how much of a background you have in, in cooking or, you know, some people grew up, their mother's always cooking. They have a lot of knowledge of, you know, different types of foods and different spices and that um, compared with, you know, people who maybe grew up in a household where there were very few home cooked meals. Um, there's or in New York where they don't even have kitchens in some of the apartments. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, um, you know, I just uh, like to remind our listeners that there um, is so much you can do with a very simple knowledge of, of cooking. And you can still eat incredibly flavorful, delightful foods, even if you're not the Le Cordon Bleu chef or whatever. You know, it really can be easy. Um, and especially once you start to transition away um, from those highly processed foods and let your taste buds kind of come back into their normal function. Um, I think a big reason that people often say, oh, the healthy food tastes bad. It's just partially because our taste buds become so accustomed yeah, they're to jaded. Yeah, the high fructose corn syrup and the MSG. And I mean, you can, you know, listen to those food scientists talk um, about the different flavors. I think it was the last podcast I was talking about the vanishing caloric density. I mean, the people that are creating these highly processed foods, they're not chefs. They're not cooks. They're scientists. Chemists. And the um, chemists, the amount of um, adulteration that's done to the foods uh, that really throws our taste buds off, you know. And so once you start getting back into mm -hmm. just eating the more natural foods in their less processed state, your taste buds kind of come back into balance and suddenly you'll find that those healthy foods, you know, do taste just as good and are maybe even more delicious, more craveable um, than the, you know, kind of junk foods that people get, you know, kind of hooked on due to all of that chemistry and kind of... Now, and you can carefully choose restaurants. Um, mm. uh, I imagine you have Jason's Deli down here. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a fair number of organic ingredients and a salad bar, even a, a big salad bar, you even the things that aren't organic, they're actual food. Right. And um, I like their organic vegetable soup. They're 
That's right. uh, kind of my go-to when I I need to feel really good the next day. Yeah. I just have a salad and organic vegetable soup, and I wake up feeling really good. Yeah. You know, and, um, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Even a non-organic vegetable is better than no vegetable at all. Yes. Um, you know, and realistically speaking, I think that the more that we as consumers voice our desire for organic foods, for GMO-free foods, we create that industry. We create that demand, and the industries will then answer that. So, you know, just in the last couple of years, I've seen a huge surge of organic foods. Um, you know, when I go to Sprouts, there's an entire refrigerated section of those um, fermented foods, uh, like you were mentioning, the sauerkraut and pickles and things that are, um, you know, created to create those really healthy probiotic sources. Um, and then also they have those really yummy flavors and things that people gravitate towards. Um, but I think for people to know that um, eating healthy doesn't mean you have to trade in delicious flavors. Maybe it's just transitioning your palate to become more accustomed to them. Uh, but there's just so much wonderful things out there and, and wonderful, delightful foods and more and more brands every day popping up to, you know. And more and more of the restaurants are, are coming out and saying, okay, well, we're not going to do artificial colors anymore. I mean, big chain restaurants. Mm -hmm. So vote with your dollars. It works. Yeah. I want to thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. This has been such an enlightening discussion. I really look forward to having you back on the program. Thank you. It was great fun. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to the podcast today. If you'd like to learn more about Marty Whittakin, you can visit healthybynatureshow.com. You'll also find links to her books, her radio show, Healthy by Nature, and lots of other resources to help you improve your health. If you'd like to learn more about us and see the video version of this podcast, along with hundreds of other health and wellness videos, you can head over to wellnessplus.tv and start your free two-week trial. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and come back and join us again soon. We at Wellness Plus specialize in all things health and wellness ranging from yoga and fitness to massage and ASMR. Whether you are looking to target specific areas of tension or want to enhance your general self-care routine, we provide the tools you need to feel better, look better, and live better. We have courses for every level, whether you're just starting out or you're a seasoned pro. Our courses provide a wide range in difficulty to accommodate your evolving flow. Welcome back to Yoga with Jess. We are going to break down some really essential postures. We are going to rock out with some of the most essential ab exercises that you need to have the abs that you've always dreamed of. I've blended techniques to help you connect with students and you can be a rock star teacher. Wellness Plus is available on your phone, tablet, or TV. Join Wellness Plus today and get your first seven days free.